Welcome to the Electronics and Programming Beginner's Guide. A uh, couple of, qu uh, couple of uh, housekeeping things before we get started. Uh, first of all, I wanted to apologize that it's been so long since my last video. Uh, school was uh, really killing me. Also, uh, hopefully I both look and sound better. So I got some new uh, recording equipment that uh, I will probably do a video on at some later point in time. And uh, in my last video for uh, parallel comms, I did say that I was going to go over a driver, but instead I've decided to uh, first look at all of the different uh, communication protocols, both parallel and serial, and then uh, continue uh, from there to then kind of bring it all together uh, with the driver. Uh, today what we're going to go over is UART. Uh, UART stands for Universal Asynchronous Receive and Transmit. So, uh, UART is uh, fundamentally different than what the parallel port was and we'll go over some of the differences and the uh, topics that I want to cover today and uh, the video on UART is probably going to be the longest because most of these topics I need to introduce and very thoroughly explain, but as we get into other communication protocols like let's say SPI or I2C, uh, it's going to be a lot easier because we have already gone over it. So I'm going to try and kind of build the videos one on top of another. So I said, uh, first we're going to go over what the structure is. Uh, what it actually looks like if you were to look at it on a scope. Uh, we've already touched on uh, some aspects of digital communication in the uh, parallel uh, bus video, but uh, we're just going to do a really quick review and then uh, more uh, in more detail talk about the structure. Uh, also we're going to talk about uh, baud rate. Uh, we're going to talk about uh, synchronous uh, versus asynchronous, and we already know that uh, UART is an asynchronous bus, but what the actual difference is. Uh, we're going to talk about half duplex versus full duplex, and we're going to uh, talk about the wiring, because there are some uh, tricky things with UART wiring. So the real introduction to actually all digital comms comes from this chart where uh, these are voltage levels and this is time. We've already seen something actually, let me note that. That's it. We've already seen something like this when we talked about uh, parallel communication, but I wanted to make this more generalized. So at the top of this is VDD. This is what your processor is being powered off of. And in general processors that's either 3.3 volts or 5 volts but there are some different voltages if you look at the uh, data sheet for your processor or even a device you're trying to talk to you'll always be given a high threshold and low threshold what these thresholds mean is that to register a one or a high level uh, your voltage has to exceed the high threshold so it has to end up in this general region right here and then to register a zero, the voltage has to uh, go below the low threshold in this area. So now that we've had a quick primer on how general digital communication works, let's look at uh, what a UART packet looks like. And this is where we come into the fundamental difference between uh, parallel and serial. What we had looked at previously was the parallel bus. With the parallel bus, if you want to send eight bits, uh, you need eight wires. With a serial bus, serial meaning in a row, you can send eight bits down a single wire. And that's really the true advantage of a serial bus. That all of the information can be crammed down a single wire continuously back to back to back but uh, you run into some other problems with uh, serial and we'll talk uh, more about that later as we talk about some of the other uh, topics that uh, I had listed. So how does a UART packet work? So first of all a UART 
uh, bus always idles high. It's always sitting at a high voltage state. The way the receiver knows that uh, so something's about to be sent down the line is that the voltage drops from a high level to a low level for the duration of one bit. So this right here is the start bit. Once the receiver uh, senses the start bit, it will then uh, pull in the data off of each individual bit. And as I mentioned previously, the voltage levels correlate to the uh, bits being sent. So the uh, first bit, which uh, UART always sends the most significant bit first and then the least significant bit last. So this would be a zero. This would be a one. This would be two zeros. And then this would be a one, 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 and one. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight bits. So all together, this number would look like zero B, B standing for binary. So it'd be zero, one, zero, zero, one, 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 one. So this would be the number that was transmitted in this particular packet. And then to make sure that the start bit for the next packet is nice and clean, a UART packet always ends with a high state, this being the end bit. So every single packet is going to look very similar to this with the two constants being that a start bit always pulls the bus low and then an end bit always ends with the bus high and then the stuff in the middle is going to change depending on what numbers you're going to send. Uh, UART always sends 8 bits at a time in the structure. So now that we know what the structure of UART looks like, the next logical question is how do you actually time all of this? How does the receiver know that, well, this is the start bit and each, where each bit lines up, etc.? And the answer is the baud rate. Uh, the baud rate is something you set in both the transmitter and receiver, and the baud rate has to match in both. In the case of uh, AutoBaud, which is a function that some receivers have, uh, you can, as the very first thing, you can send a special character. The uh, UART module in that particular device will analyze that uh, special character and then figure out what the bot is. Uh, but there are so many different variations on AutoBot, I just wanted to talk about a regular baud rate. So, like I mentioned, the baud rate has to be set in both the transmitter and receiver. This is how they know uh, what to send and at what speed. So what the baud rate refers to is how many bits in the second the transmitter can send and the receiver can receive. So each one of these things is a bit and then the amount of time is uh, effectively the baud rate. A really common uh, UART baud rate is 9600, meaning that you can send 9600 bits in a second. 9600 baud comes out to, let me grab my trusty calculator because I don't memorize these things, uh, 0 0.000104 seconds per bit. So what that means is that the duration of each bit is uh, known at 9600 baud. And that's how uh, the receiver knows when do I actually sample uh, the different uh, bits. What the uh, receiver does is every time there is a transmission, the receiver uh, internally synchronizes the UART module to the baud rate. So the thing about UART is a packet can come in at any time. So the receiver constantly monitors the line and whenever it sees the start bit, that low 
drop. It then says, well, after one uh, what is it, microsecond has passed, I can now sample in this area to see that if this is a one or a zero. And then after another one microsecond has passed, I can sample in this bit, and then the next bit, and then the next bit. And this is how the receiver pulls in the data. The thing about the baud rate, the baud rate uh, internally to a microcontroller depends on uh, the speed of the microcontroller. So uh, a baud rate really resembles a divider or a prescaler. It can be sometimes referred to inside the microcontroller. So you take the speed of the microcontroller and then you divide it by some sort of internal number and then that number will give you your baud rate. So this ability of your to be able to receive a packet at any time uh, perfectly segues into the idea of synchronous versus asynchronous. So as I mentioned earlier, uh, UART is asynchronous and it's uh, built right into the name. And what that refers to is that both the transmitter and receiver have to be able to agree on a baud rate and the transmitter does not tell anything to the receiver about the speed at which well, barring Autobod, uh, about the speed that it's going to be coming in at. Also, uh, your communications can be transmitted at any time. And that's actually, at least to me, one of the advantages of UART because you can just, you know, stream a bunch of data out and it's relevant when or how that streaming happens. It's almost like a, a set it and forget it kind of operation. So it said, uh, your is asynchronous and the, the synchronizing is then entirely in the hands of the receiver and that's done with the start bit and the end bit. In uh, the one downfall of your is that your isn't terribly fast. There are some much faster protocols. And one of the reasons for that is that UART has to, for each packet, be able to resynchronize the communications. Also, every single packet to send eight bits, you have to send 10 bits. So you, because of the start bit and the end bit. Uh, for the next video, I'm most likely going to talk about I squared C. And uh, the idea of synchronous versus asynchronous is going to make so much more sense when, you, uh, when we talk about I squared C because I squared C has a separate clock line that it used for synchronizing where uh, your does not. So now let's talk about the idea of half duplex and full duplex. And personally, it took me a little while to really wrap my head around what does half duplex versus full duplex mean. The best analogy I can give you is a, a telephone versus a walkie talkie. A telephone is considered full duplex and I actually think that the that terminology comes directly from really old school landline telephones. What full duplex means is that uh, you can both hear and speak into the phone at the same time, meaning that you can send and receive at the same time. In the case of a half duplex, which would be like a walkie talkie, you can only do one action at a time. You uh, either listen to the walkie talkie or you push the button and speak into the walkie talkie. You can't push the button, speak into the walkie talkie and hear what's being uh, transmitted to you at the same time. Uh, UART classically is full duplex and uh, it'll make more sense when I show you how UART is wired. There are some devices that you can get that can uh, force UART to be half duplex. A microcontroller uh, at least today, uh, will have a UART module built internally, meaning that there is a separate section of its silicon substrate that is specifically dedicated to talking in UART. 
with your software, you will then communicate with this module and you will configure it, set its baud rate, uh, set any other settings in it that you want, and then enable it or turn it on. And then this module will then, in hardware, uh, control these four pins. These are the four classic pins for UART. Although only these top two are used anymore, these bottom two uh, you know, have gone the way of the Dota, so to speak. So the idea here is that, let's say you want to transmit uh, one byte or eight bits. You then load those eight bits into UART. And then you are in hardware will control the pins to make sure that the message is sent out. So what are these four pins? First of all, the, the first pin is TX, or this is a short for transmit. Whenever you load a byte into the UART module, the UART module will then uh, toggle the TX pin uh, following the data structure that we looked at earlier to send the byte out. The RX pin is then the opposite. The RX pin is the receive. Uh, the UART module uh, sits there and watches the RX pin to see if any data is coming in. And when that data is coming in, it captures the different states according to the set baud rate. Then it stores that byte internally and exposes to your software a register that that byte could be read from and then pulled into your software. Then you have the uh, ready to send and clear to send pins. Uh, these pins are part of what's called a uh, of hardware flow control. Uh, these pins anymore to, are not used. I do believe, but don't quote me on this, that uh, these pins come from uh, older systems where uh, the receiver could actually get overloaded uh, with the amount of data coming in. So it needed to be able to tell the sender to stop. So the ready to send pin is exactly what that is. Whenever the receiver sees that, oh, I, I have too much data coming in, it can, uh, over this pin, signal the transmitter, hey, could you stop sending? In the same uh, fashion, the uh, CTS or uh, clear to send pin does the exact opposite. That when this is the transmitter, it will check this pin to see, well, is the receiver uh, being overloaded? And if it sees a signal on this pin to, uh, that says, please stop sending, it will finish the bytes that it's currently on and then uh, stop transmitting. When wiring up to your devices, as I said earlier, there is a tricky thing. Uh, the tricky thing is that there is what at least I like to refer to as an inversion. What that inversion is that the TX line of, let, let's call this processor 1, has to go to the receive line of processor 2. So whatever this guy is sending, this guy can receive. So you get this crossing of signal lines like that. And the same thing happens in the other direction. The transmit line of this processor goes to the receive line of this processor. Since I brought it up, the RS, uh, RTS and CTS pins also get a inversion where the RTS pins uh, is an output and the CTS pin is an input. So you get the same kind of inversion where uh, processor two has to tell processor one about hardware, you know, about when to send, and processor one tells processor two in the same uh, manner. The, the hardware flow control pins are hardly ever used anymore. Uh, the UART modules are advanced enough anymore that you can easily do without these. And uh, the uh, software should be written in such a manner that uh, these pins uh, should not be required. Uh, also, uh, 
so uh, looking at this, the idea of full duplex is a lot easier to see. Because there is a separate wire for, let's say, the TX from 2 to uh, RX from 1, this line can communicate at any time and has no bearing on the other line, the TX from processor 1 to RX to processor 2. This line can also be sending data at the same time. So they can talk to each other at the same time without interrupting each other. So this is what a full duplex really means for your. The downfall of UART, and I don't know if you've caught this yet or not, but UART is a really well made for having two things talk to each other, and that's it. There is some trickery you can do to get UART to talk to a bunch of things, and I'll talk about that in just a second, but just really, you know, naked UART, two things talk to each other, and that's it. So then the real question is, how do you get more than two UART devices to talk to each other? There are really two different ways. Uh, the first is, if your devices have more than a single UART, which is, for larger devices, really not that uncommon anymore. So you have two devices, and let's say this has a uh, UART 1, and this has a UART 1, and then you connect the two, with the lines, and just for the sake of shorthand, we'll call this two. The little slash and two means that's two wires. Well, now you have another device. How do you get all three devices to talk to each other? Well, let's say each device has more than one U word. So then this has U2, and this has U1, and then you connect the two with a, a two wire bus. And then this has U2 and U2, and then you connect these with another one. So now any device can talk to any other device. Or if you really want to make a chain, you could instead go like this. So put another device here and go U2, to, let's say to U1 with a bus of two, and then go U2 uh, two to yet another device, U1 with another bus of two. Uh, the problem with the setup is that if this micro needs to talk to this micro, it has to send the message down all of them. A way to avoid that is with something called a half duplex, or uh, they make a special transceiver. So what you get is a device that has a UART line and then you interface that UART line with a transceiver. So you have a, a TX line, an RX line, and then a direction pin. So what this does is this chip, this transceiver, allows you to connect to a bus that connects a whole bunch of things together. And then, uh, depending on what the direction pin is set to, the transceiver, the transceiver will either read the bus and send things on the RX pin to the processor, or it will uh, translate the TX pin and send things out on the bus. So what this looks like is you have uh, multiple devices. Each device then has one of these transceivers with the same kinds of connections. And then a set of data lines uh, that connect them all together. The exact topology of the data lines is relevant because there's a bunch of different variations. For example, if it's uh, 485, RS-485, uh, this protocol comes in both half duplex and full duplex format. So if this is a half duplex, this would be a two, meaning there's two wires connected between uh, all of them. And uh, so being half duplex, 
as I mentioned earlier, uh, it's like, it works like a walkie-talkie. No two things can talk at the same time. So whereas with classic UART and full duplex, the two modules can talk to each other at any time for any reason without interfering with each other, in a half duplex setup, only a single device can talk at the same time because if two guys try to talk to each other, they will talk over each other and you get issues with that. So in this kind of setup, it's very important to have a master-slave setup. So you, one module is designated as the master and the other two modules are dedicated as slaves and you work in a call and response type fashion. So the master says, module one, please tell me this information. And then the master will wait while module one tells it all of the information. When module one is done, it stops talking and will not start talking unless the master asks for the information again. Same with module two. The master says, module two, please send me this information. Module two will send it and module one will sit there and wait quietly while module two does this. Once the information is sent, module two stops talking unless the information is requested from the master. The biggest downfall in this kind of uh, setup is that the two slaves cannot directly talk to each other. Uh, the, uh, all of the information, all of the, the hard, all, that, all of the data control has to be done by the master. So this has been a very basic overview of UART. Uh, UART does have some finer points that I think are outside the uh, purview of this video. Now you know how UART works and some of the uh, tricky things for implementing it, like for example, the inversion of the RX and TX pin. And as I mentioned earlier, uh, the next video is gonna be about I squared C. Uh, I squared C has some advantages and some disadvantages to UART and uh, we'll take a look at all of those. Thank you for watching.